Welcome to the Imaging Wire show. My name is Brian Casey and I'm managing editor of the Imaging Wire. Got a great episode for you today. Our topic is radiology training to practice insights to help the workforce crisis. And our guests are Daniel Arnold. He is CEO and co-founder of online education company Modality and Deanna Heyer, PhD. She is head of educational strategy and operations at Modality. Daniel and Deanna, thanks for being with us today. Thanks for having us. So, Daniel, can you introduce yourself and, and tell us a little bit about Modality? Yeah, and it's it's great to be back, Brian, uh, with you. And um, congrats to, what what are you, are you two years now at the Imaging Wire? Uh, year and a half. Year and a half. Year and a half. Yeah. Um, I, I read it every day and, and not a week goes by where I'm not sharing your articles with my team, awesome. deriving new insights. So well, thanks for your uh, we're big fans of yours. And, you know, it's great to be back on the show. Uh, radio, uh, Modality has established itself over the last few years as the market leader globally in radiology education and compliance management solutions. And we're excited to talk to you more about that here today. Awesome. So, uh, Deanna, can you tell us a little bit about your background and your role at Modality? Yeah, sure. It's great to be with you, Brian. So I've been in medical education for the last 20 years, um, working across different specialties and with experts in oncology, HIV, hepatitis, and now here in radiology. And I'm really excited here to be with Modality and kind of seeing the impact that we can really have in training radiologists that are in practice and the ones coming in the future. Great. So, so Daniel, as you mentioned, we've spoken a few times over the last year or so. And um, can you tell us a little bit more or, or give us an update on uh, what's been going on at Modality recently? Sure. So you know, I think the, the stat that gets us the most excited is the impact that we're having. And as Deanna shared, in the last year, over a million topics have been completed on Modality. Um, and that's a million chances to save a patient's life or improve their care journey. Courses on everything from early identification of cancer, critical findings in stroke, um, and, and so on. And so we're just so proud by the impact that we're having in the medical community. 95% of people that view our courses report improved confidence, accuracy, and efficiency in reading studies after completing our courses. More than that, when, when we first got to know each other on the Imaging Wire, Brian, we weren't working with too many practices. We've started to work a lot with um, residency programs, but we've really expanded our offerings to support some of the, the largest as well as smallest radiology practices around the country. And we'll talk a little bit about how we do that, but we have now over 125 enterprise clients and have added 50 just this year. And so the, the, the growth has been... Um, just phenomenal as we've grown our content library and, and feature set. So really proud of that and excited to share more about the product here today. Great. So you, you you talked a little bit about challenges, but one of the big challenges right now in radiology, as everybody knows, is is the workforce shortage. And practices are really having a tough time recruiting and retaining radiologists. And you guys are mostly an education firm, but education and training ties into, uh, you know, the workforce issue uh, pretty closely. Can, can you talk about the traditional model for radiologist training and, and what are some of the shortcomings of that? Yeah, so let's talk about the workforce shortage. So the workforce shortage is the number one problem facing radiology practices today. And one of the results of that is that complex studies often sit on the list. Your prostate MRIs, your cardiac CTs, these are impacting patient care um, and they're impacting um, practices bottom lines. And so groups are coming to Modality principally for two things. One is train existing radiologists to help out beyond their initial scope of expertise. Um, and that's our really core uh, product. I'm an existing radiologist and I need to develop some new skills or update my skills in a, in a given clinical area. And in, and in doing so, I can read you know, more complex studies more quickly. And then number two is helping upskill new radiologists that are entering the workforce. We're going to talk a little bit about how we do that today. But everyone from residents in training who maybe are doing a subspecialty, but need to add additional subspecialty skills in order to be competitive in the market, or folks that are actually in practice, maybe they, they finished a neuroradiologist, but the group really needs them to be strong in GenRAD or, or help out in, in body or MSK or in some other area. And so we match practices to their clinical gaps to the new radiologists that are coming into their workforce and provide education. And those are the two ways that we help address the workforce shortage. So 
on a practical basis, you might have a radiologist who trained in breast imaging and they get a hired at a practice that, you know, sure they do breast imaging, but they may need cardiac, they may need, you know, body, they may need brain. And so you, you can help radiologists get up to speed uh, to work at that practice. Yeah, that's exactly right, Brian. She'll, Deanna will support this with data here in a bit. But, you know, put simply, when you do a fellowship, you're spending one year typically focused exclusively in, in one area. And then what radiologists say when they come into the job market is they say, hey, I'm, I'm a neuroradiologist. I, I love neuroradiology. I learned a lot in my fellowship program. I'd like to spend 100% of my time practicing in neuroradiology. And then they go out to the job market and, you know, you get a 20 person group out in the community who's saying, hey, you know, that's that's not possible. You know, 60, 70 percent neuro would be great, but we really need you helping out across, you know, two, three, four specialties. And so there's a real mismatch from what training programs are developing for our workforce for today. And so everything we're doing is about helping radiologists become skilled in mo across multiple areas and matching those skills to the job that that radiology practices need them to fill. Excellent. So Deanna, can you talk a little bit about some of the services that Modality offers that address some of these issues that are uh, you know, affecting the workforce right now? Sure thing. Yeah. I mean, really the core of what we do is help radiologists to gain confidence and experience by offering them a place where they can practice. Um, so on the modality site, a radiologist can learn by watching other experts scroll through cases, learn their approach and how they go through each of those cases, some tips on ways to become more efficient and make sure you don't miss, um, but then give them the environment to practice. So we have Dicons that they can scroll through and assess themselves in a safe environment where they can gain experience and exposure to these different cases before they have them in their work list. And we hear from our radiologists all the time that they will see a case come up in their work list right after they saw it on our website, that they saw very similar cases to what they're doing day to day and that they're able to immediately apply what they learn to their practice. And they can do it on their own time. That's really big for us is the accessibility of the model. You need the education at the time that you need it, right? And so being able to go on the site, do a few minutes, it's a micro learning model. So you're able to do case by case, at however much time you have that day and keep progressing and growing your skill set. That's great. Uh, so Daniel, how are, how are your customers using your service? You know, there's there's uh, no one way that customers use us. We work with everyone from, you know, a nine-person radiology practice in rural Minnesota who reads everything to our our largest customer in the U.S. is Radiology Associates of North Texas, 300-person group, highly subspecialized. Um, and, and they work with us across a number of ways. Number one is upskilling existing RADs. Um, you know, I'll tell you a story. They actually merged with a group locally and that local group needed prostate readers. They called us up. They said, hey, you know, we need two more prostate readers immediately. So they went through our training programs. Within three months, they were reading prostates at a high quality level in that practice. And so that was immediate ROI for the group. Other ways that they're using us is um, onboarding new radiologists, recruiting residents. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about how they're doing that. And then finally, and, and, and this is really new since since you and I have spoke, Brian, is in compliance management. And so if you have multiple radiologists increasingly reading across multiple states, managing your compliance is a really complex and onerous and expensive process, often done manually today. And so we built software to make that better for the radiologists as well as the, administ as well as the administrative teams to help them as their groups scale in complexity. Mm, that's great. So last year, Modality published, uh, for the first time, your uh, radiology practice development report. And so that was a survey where you looked into some of the major issues in radiologist training. And um, now you're featuring the second edition of the report. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit about the report, Deanna? And um, maybe we'll uh, jump into some of the findings in a minute. Yeah, sure thing. I mean, one of the things I really love about Modality is that we're always working with our learners, we're always hearing from our radiologists about what they need. And that's really what you see on the site are the courses that people have told us they need the most. And so what we do is we have an ongoing needs assessment. And so the report last year, I think we had 2000 or so this year, we have over 3300 radiologists that went through our needs assessment in 2023. And we've gotten a good sense of what their gaps are, what their training needs are, 
And being able to see that year over year and be able to make sure that we're supporting them the best way we can is what I love about the education that we can bring to them. So what we have reported this year are kind of the updated data. We'll, we'll see, you know, some of that that you'll put up. Um, here in a minute, but also we started to dig in a little more on residency training and how upstream um, the training path that people are taking, how that has implications on the workforce and kind of what they're thinking about, um, what their needs are before they take that first job. Um, so we'll have some exciting data there too. All right, great. So we do have a few slides here so we can actually take a look at uh, some of the data. So uh, Deanne, if you can just walk us through and uh, show us uh, what we're looking at. Yeah, sure thing. It's my favorite thing to do is to dive into the data that we're seeing from our radiologists. And one of the key things we've learned is that our radiologists are working across multiple subspecialties. On average, four to five subspecialties that they are reading in in their daily practice. And then 43% reported that they read across all the subspecialties. So they really need to stay up on their knowledge and skills across all all of the subspecialties that might come into their work list that day. Um, so here you can kind of get a sense of, you know, neuroradiology is, is an area that most half, half of our uh, surveyors have um, are reading every day. Um, but you can see across the board, really across neuro, MSK, body, less reading in nuclear and cardiac and pediatrics and breast. But again, those are areas we know have increasing volumes. And so, you know, I think the scenario Daniel talked about earlier where somebody may be hired in one specialty, but just the reality of the workforce situation and the challenge that they have is that they're going to be asked to read these other studies. The other thing we surveyed on is their confidence levels when they are reading across these subspecialties. And this is also really interesting to us to see, you know, people are reporting that they're somewhat confident across the board, but not very confident. And a lot of that comes with just gaining experience and seeing more cases um, and being ready when you see that pathology and just kind of knowing that you've got this. And so something that we're able to help people with as you look across the spectrum here is where are those areas where they are feeling the least confident and they can use a platform like ours to really gain that experience. Go through go through five cases a week. Maybe they don't come into your work list often enough. And so you don't feel that you're that confident in it, but you probably are okay. And you just need to keep up your skills. And so coming on the site and just doing five cardiac CT cases a week will help you really stay you know, more confident in what you're doing when you have to do it in practice. Um, so here, you know, we saw the least confidence in those studies I mentioned. So cardiac, nuclear medicine, breast, pediatrics, um, again, areas that are going to have increasing volumes, you know, particularly with some of the new CMS decisions that we we know and read about in the imaging wire also. But there are things going on in the field that are going to only increase the volumes of these types of studies. And people really need to be ready to be able to address that in the in their daily work. And so one thing we think about with uh, how we can help is the upskilling of the workforce. And so there's a, there's a great phrase that somebody shared with me recently. It's how we right-size our workforce to really help us with the crisis. So it doesn't help us if everybody is just great at chest imaging or breast imaging um, when we need people reading those cardiac CT or CT colonography studies as well. And so what we surveyed radiologists on here are where are those areas that you are not currently reading but would like to be reading in those subspecialties? And you can see some of these harder, um, least confident areas like cardiac, nuclear medicine, PEDS, MSK, that there is a willingness to move into those subspecialties. And when you ask them why they aren't reading in them, the barrier is almost always training. It's training or it's, you know, a certification they need to get. And that's something that we can easily help them with um, to be able to gain those skills, to be able to start reading in those areas. And as Daniel mentioned, we're working with groups. And so in the same way, if a group is taking on and implementing a new study, so let's say contrast enhanced mammography or nuclear medicine, maybe you want to get a theranostics program going, um, we are able to help them train their existing radiologists to then be able to fill those spots and take on those volumes at their uh, practice. 
One thing we we did a little different this year is we wanted to learn more about radiologist training and kind of what that path is before they are attendings in their day-to-day job. Um, And we work with a lot of residents through our training platform. And so we did a survey of our U.S.-based residents and saw some really interesting data here that we've included in the report. We wanted to get to know what are they doing after residency or what did they think they want to do after residency. And what you can see in the the first chart there is that after residency, 78% are planning to do a fellowship, okay? And 22% already know that they're going to go into private practice or academic medicine. When you think of the field, uh, as Daniel mentioned earlier, there is a real push towards formal training leading towards subspecialization. And this aligns pretty closely with that. Everybody assumes they're going to do a fellowship, at least the majority. But it does look like those numbers are changing. So, you know, in the past, you I've seen surveys that say 98 percent of fellows are, are sorry, of residents are planning on going into fellowship. And so I think people are starting to just think about their their options and whether a fellowship is really the right move for them. So we see that in the data. And then we ask them what their plans are after fellowship. And this is something I found really interesting is that already half of them know what they want to do after their fellowship. They either want to go into private practice. So 41% were planning to go into private practice and 15% were planning to go into academic medicine. And so you kind of have to ask yourself, well, if you already know that you want to go into private practice, um, why are you doing that that fellowship? And is it because you just don't have other options? You think it's the right thing to do? And so we we heard from a lot of them that that exact answer that it's it's they think they're supposed to subspecialize that that is what we are supposed to do. So it's quite interesting when you think about it because as we talked about earlier, once they get into their job, while while you want the depth, you really need the breadth of of all of the subspecialties once you are in in that job. And so a lot of the the practices are really sh- challenged with the fact that people are coming out with a lot of subspecialty training, but take a longer to onboard and get them into the reading pool because they are too subspecialized. And so we have a mismatch basically of where their training path is taking them and what the workforce needs actually are. So one thing we proposed to them in that survey was if you had the option of a private practice fellowship, would you be interested in doing something like that where you could have more of an on-the-job training type of model? And 73% were interested. And then the ones that were going into private practice are already new in residency. That's what they wanted to do. 83% of them said, yes, we would, we would prefer to go into a private practice fellowship. So, so what we're proposing here again is just trying to, to get a better match of how people are getting into the workforce. How can we get them in sooner? so that we can really help a lot of the challenges that we're seeing with that workforce shortage is to make sure people are trained in a way that they're ready on day one. And then one more thing uh, that we did survey the U.S. residents on was, you know, what factors are they using when they decide if they want to do a fellowship or if they want to go into private practice or academic medicine? And overwhelmingly, across all of the subgroups that we looked at, work-life balance was the number one factor that they are considering in that job setting. And I think this resonates a lot to what's going on in many industries, um, just the priorities that we are all faced with day to day and knowing that our employer supports those those priorities, um, you know, is something that I think really came out very strongly in this survey. Job location and salary and benefits were came up as second and third. But interestingly, when you do kind of look at those, the sub analysis, salary and benefits was um, was the majority of time people's second choice reason. So even though work life balance is very important, salary and benefits always weighed in into their their choice that they're making. And you did see it a little more in the undecided group that they were they did rank salary and benefits a little bit higher than. Oh, that's amazing data. Were, were you were you a little surprised at how high? Uh, and Daniel Ch- Chippen as well here. But were you were you a little surprised at how high the work life balance ranked compared to salary? You know, I I was Brian, and and I've been puzzling at what's going on there. You know, I think first of all, 
people really want to work with a group that they value very highly. And so I think there's a lot in work-life balance. And so one of the things that I'd like to unpack in a future survey is what does work-life balance mean to you? Does it mean that you have more vacation? Does it mean that you have the flexibility to go to your kid's soccer game on, on the weekends? And does it mean that you can work from home? And so I think there's a lot in work-life balance that we need to unpack. And I'm excited to to look into that deeper. And then I think the second thing is, and, and since Deanna hit this about the, the salaries, I think salaries are so high right now that folks are saying, oh, gee, my, my needs are going to be met whatever group I go to, given that I'd like to negotiate for the best work-life balance. And if you start to see salaries come down, you might see those things flip on its head. But I think right now anyone can get a starting salary that's the best it's ever been for you know, uh, incoming residents and fellows. And so uh, they have a little bit more leverage than they have in the past to ask for these things. So, you know, but given that it's it's challenging because if you're a private practice, you know, you can't just give work-life balance to the new guy. You got your partnership. And so how are we going to share in that work-life balance? And how do you get to work-life balance when volumes are so high? And so what people want may not be possible for many groups to deliver sustainably. And, and um, so it's, it's, it's hard out there for groups to, to make these pieces come together. Now, uh, we mentioned earlier, this is the second edition of the report. Um, and you, you came out with the first edition a year ago. Deanna, were there any changes year to year or did some of these issues stay more or less the same? I think I remember last year, cardiac and nuclear medicine were also kind of at the low end of, of where the survey respondents said they had confidence reading. Yeah, we did see similar trends and results this year. But the one place I did notice for planning is that there was an uptick in interest in breast imaging and cardiac imaging specifically. Um, and so, you know, I think that's that's also a testament to the the volumes and, and that people are experiencing and also the fact that those areas require a certain number of CME hours and certification training before you can begin reading uh, in breast mammography, cardiac CT, cardiac MR. And so they're really seeking out um, more of those opportunities because they need that for their to be able to do their practice. So we did see an uptick in those areas since 20, the 2022 data. Well, and, and to get specific on how we help groups there, we actually can help a, a radiologist maintain their MQSA. We can help a, a radiologist get their um, SCCT level one, level two cardiac certifications. And so part of the reason we collect this data is to figure out what are those needs and then how can we help meet them um, here at Modality. Very good. So Deanna, um, I'm assuming Modality is going to continue with the report. Anything maybe we could look forward to next year? Yeah, I mean, we we love the data. We love hearing from from our learners and, you know, just kind of always learning from them. So, yes, we've still been collecting needs assessment data all year long this year as well. And so we'll have three years of data next year. We're excited to look at those trends and any changes year over year. So you sh you will be hearing more from us. All right. And if you're a, a modality user and you get a you get a survey invitation uh, probably next summer, be sure to fill it out. Um, Daniel, what, what can we look forward to seeing from modality, uh, in the near future? We're kind of in the, we're starting the artist, the, the run up to RSNA. I'm sure you guys have got a lot of great things in store. What can we look forward to seeing from you? Yeah. So, so two things. One is Deanna posed the question, would you be interested in a private practice fellowship? And 83% of folks going into private practice said yes. So I think the next logical question is what, what's a private practice fellowship? And I think we've been setting out to answer that question in partnership with private practices around the world. And so expect more to come there. And then in terms of RSNA, uh, you know, I think we threw arguably the best party uh, at all of RSNA last year. Literally at the dark place. Uh, uh, so Brian, Jake, and the whole Imaging Wire family are, of course, invited. We hope to see you there. And, uh, you know, we can't wait to uh, meet everybody on the booth floor. Sounds great. All right. Well, some great discussion today. I'd like to thank Daniel Arnold and Deanna Heyer of Modality for being with us. Thanks, Brian. Good to be with you, Brian. Thank you. All right. Signing off for the Imaging Wire, my name is Brian Casey.